hello church. Happy New Year. Uh, it's going to be a hard act to follow right there, let me tell you, okay? Um, it's been great worshiping with you today. I, I was listening to you guys back, backstage and you sound awesome, you sound wonderful. My countdown clock has already begun and Clay's already stole about three or four minutes of my time. So I'm going to dive right into what we're going to talk about today. First of all, let me welcome you to the lift, all right? We're glad that you are here today. Uh, January the 1st, 2023. We're starting a brand new year today. And I'm so grateful and I'm so glad that you chose to start your new year in church. Whether you're on campus today with us here at the lift or whether you're watching us online today, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being in church today and for beginning your brand new uh, brand new year with us here at the Lift. We're so glad that you're doing that. Um, if you're a guest or a visitor, and this is your very first time at the Lift, let me ask you to please make sure you tune in if you're watching online uh, at a later time or come back and visit again so that you can meet Pastor Lance and uh, the team here at the Lift. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. So please don't judge the teaching ministry of this church by what you hear today, okay? Make sure you come back and hear Lance. And I promise you, you will be, um, you will be blessed and it'll add tremendous value um, to your life. And Lance, I'm grateful for the opportunity, buddy. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, I know what it's like to stand in his shoes and to walk in his shoes. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do this. This is the first time since July that I've had an opportunity to preach or to speak in a setting like this. And I'm going to tell you part of my story today to help you understand uh, a little bit about what God has done um, in my life. Okay, let me begin by asking you a question. How many of you know that everybody has a story? Let me see your hand. All right, in the church world, we like to say it this way. Every person has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. So turn to your neighbor and say to them, you have a story, real quick. You have a story. If you're alive and sucking air on this side of eternity on planet Earth, all right, your life has a story to tell. Whether you're a Christ follower or whether you're checking out Christianity, you're not sure about church, you're checking in this guy named Jesus, you're not sure what this is all about, regardless of where you're at in your relationship with God or your life's journey, your life tells a story and your story matters to God. And there's not any aspect of your life that does, not, um, uh, uh, that does not escape the notice of God Almighty uh, himself. Uh, so today I want to tell you part of my story, if that's okay. And my prayer for today is that some way, somehow, uh, part of what God is doing and has done in my life, specifically over the last uh, a few number of years that some way, somehow, whether you're on campus today or whether you're watching online, my story will have some kind of, uh, of relativeness to, to your story. And maybe as, as I've been able to make sense of some things that have happened in my life today, maybe some light bulbs will go off in your life and you'll be able to begin to make some sense about your story. I want to begin in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Um, if you're not familiar with Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. He was the third king of the nation of Israel. He was the wisest person that ever lived because God gave him supernatural wisdom uh, beyond his years and beyond his life experience to govern the nation of Israel. And when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, what you're going to find is basically Solomon's wise diary about life. And I would encourage you, if, uh, if you would take some time this week to read the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you have some questions about life and what life is really all about, why some things are maybe happening the way that uh, we don't think they should happen, or why some things are going on in your life that you're not sure about, Solomon, I, I promise you, will bring some clarity to you about the meaning and purpose and significance of life. And there's a lot of wisdom in Ecclesiastes. So I want to begin in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 today. just want to read two verses uh, to set up uh, where we're headed today and, and what I want to talk about, okay? It's a familiar passage of scripture if you've been around the church world very long. Uh, if you like 70s music, you'll remember these lyrics from some secular music. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, here's what Solomon says. 
He says, for everything, there is a season and a time for every activity under heaven. He says in verse two, there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest. There's another translation of verse number two that says there's a time to plant and there's a time to to uproot, okay? Uh, There's a time and a season for everything. And, and, And these two verses right here, and I spent a lot of time in Ecclesiastes over the last three years. That's why I love this book so much because it makes so much sense about the world that you and I are living in and, and what, we, what we face and what we experience every day as human beings on this side of eternity. But these two verses right here have defined my entire life of 52 years. I know I don't look 52 years old, but I just turned on December the 8th of last year. I had my 52nd birthday. And if there's any passage of scripture in in, in the Bible that sums up my entire existence, it's these two verses right here. What I specifically want to do today is kind of give you a high level um, uh, uh, overlook, so to speak, of, of my story. And I'm going to give you just kind of a 30,000 view of the last 30 years or so. And then I'm going to drill down on, on the last three years. And I want to explain my story today in seasons, just like Ecclesiastes talks about, just like Solomon talks about. And I want to explain, I want to share my story in four seasons uh, today. Okay, so if you're ready to hear my story, say, uh-huh. All right, here we go, all right? Um, As Clay mentioned a moment ago, uh, on November the 10th in 1990, I married my junior high and high school sweetheart. Her name is Karen, she's here today. We just celebrated 32 years of being married. I got married at the age of nine. Yeah, that's worth celebrating. She's put up with me uh, for 32 years. I got married at 19, she was 20. Side note. Getting married at age 19 is not the wisest decision that I ever made in my life, okay? And that's another story, that's another sermon, that's another talk uh, for another time. But we got married on November the 10th in 1990. Uh, We lived here in Monroe, and like Clay said, I attended, and my family, we attended First Baptist Church of Indian Trail. I remember when Clay's hair was not always white, okay? And I remember a little guy from Greer, South Carolina, who was still in high school at that time, who would come and visit his uncle and go to our youth retreats and our youth camps, and his name was Lance. And this kid had great hair. That's what I remember about Lance, all right? Lance has still got great hair uh, today. I actually had hair back then, and, and, and I'm losing it fast, but we attended First Baptist Church of Indian Trail. Make a long story short, through some circumstances and situations in my life, uh, God said, Brian, I've got a plan for your life that um, if you'll surrender to me, um, I- I'll do some things that you never imagined or dreamed that I could do in you and through you. And I said yes to Jesus. Uh, I'm glad that God had a plan for my life because I did it at that particular time. Uh, Fast forward a little bit, um, in 2001, God took us to a little one-stop light town in rural central Florida called Crescent City, Florida. And God said, Brian, I want you to plant a church in Crescent City that's different from every other church that's there. And God just gave us a heart for that community. So in 2004, with 10 people in a living room, we started Uh, a church that we would call South Putnam Church. Putnam County was the name of the county that we lived in. And for the next 15 years, God would take us on an amazing journey of growing us to be adults, to be parents, to be uh, the, the spouse, to be a leader, a pastor, and just a person in general that that God wanted me to be. And I tell people all the time, starting a church and pastoring a church is the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life, but I wouldn't trade the experience for anything in the world. You see, I'm living proof that God can use anybody. I've never been to seminary. I have no formal training. I'm just somebody who said yes to Jesus and said, God, whatever you wanna do in my life, I'm along for the ride. I'm along for the journey. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be who you want me to be. 
And for the next 15 years, God gave us an amazing opportunity to plant a church in a, in a small rural town. And we just got to do, see God do some amazing things. Another side note, earlier that year or in 2004, the same year that we planted our church, my father passed away at 59 years old of stage four lung cancer. You heard Clay mention my father was on staff here at First Baptist Indian Trail at that particular time. And my dad had never been sick a day in his life. Never spent the night in a hospital until the day that he was diagnosed. But at 59 years old, in 2004, the same year that we started our church, uh, my father passed away from stage four lung cancer. And I had to do one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I had to preach his funeral. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. We'll stop right here for just a second. Let me ask you another question. How many of you are planners? Let me see your hands. Uh, you like to have a plan. You like to make the plan. You like to work the plan. You got the to-do list. You're checking things off the box, okay? I I'm with you. I'm right there with you. I'm one of those planners too. Solomon, the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, wrote another book of the Bible that we know is the book of Proverbs. And it's wisdom from, from Solomon. Solomon also has a verse for those of us that are planners. Listen to what he says in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 9. He says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Simply that verse can be summed up in, in this statement right here. God is sovereign and he's in control. God is sovereign and he is absolutely in control. So season one of my life is what I would call the anticipation season. God, I'm not sure what you're going to do in my life. I'm available. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be who you want me to be. God, take me wherever you want to take me. Season two, that season where God called me to plant a church and pastor it and to lead it is what I would call a season of, of growth. And maybe you're in a season of anticipation right now. Maybe you're in a season of growth right now where God is growing you and, and showing you and revealing himself to you. Uh, season three is where, I wanna, is where I wanna drill down and, and, and really unpack this idea of how we can make our plans, but at the end of the day, it is the Lord who determines our steps. In September of 2019, just about three and a half years ago, uh, I accepted a position at a new church in Palm Coast, Florida. God made it really clear that our, our season at, as a church planter and as a lead pastor, that that season was over. And, and, and Karen and I, we resigned our position at our church. We worked a transition plan for about six months. And in September of 2019, I went on staff at a very fast-growing uh, uh, non-denominational Christian church in Palm Coast, Florida. I live three miles from the beach, sunny weather. It was beautiful, a great town, great church. I had a wonderful opportunity to engage in a different kind of ministry where I didn't have to be the lead guy and I didn't have to be the guy that was on stage every single week and I had some responsibility and, and uh, was just really excited about a new season of life that God was gonna give us in that place and if I could sum up the last three years of my life in one word it would be this word right here uncertain the next three years would be the most uncertain season of my life so I've gone from a season of anticipation to a season of of growth and now I find myself in a, in a season of, of uncertainty. And that's what I want to talk about today. How many of you know that sometimes life is uncertain? Maybe you're going through an uncertain season right now where you or maybe a family member or a friend or a neighbor that you're really close to, they've got that medical diagnosis that they didn't expect. Maybe like Emmanuel was talking about a while ago, uh, you had a job last year, but this time you're still trying to figure out what, where you're going to work or, or what door God's going to open for you. Maybe because of the pandemic and, 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 and inflation and the uncertainty of our world in, gen in general, you just stay discouraged and defeated and depressed and you're battling uh, a, a mental struggle just to get up out of bed every single day. And, and, and every day is, 
is uncertain for you right now. Wherever you're at in, in your season of uncertainty, if you're in that season, uh, I hope you'll lean in for just the next few minutes and listen to what, what God wants to say to you and to me. Here's what my season of uncertainty looked like specifically over the last three years. I mentioned that I took a new position on a new church in September 2019. I don't remember the exact month or day or time, but somewhere in late 2018 or early 2019, my mother, who's my hero, was diagnosed with colon cancer. Totally unexpected, out of the blue, caught our family off guard, just like my father's lung cancer had done some 15 years earlier. At the same time, I began to notice that I didn't have the, the level of energy that I, that I used to have. And some routine things that I would do on a day-to-day -day basis would cause me just to have to stop and sit down and, and catch my breath. And it got to the point as I was headed up to my 50th birthday in December of that year that, well, Brian, you're just getting older. You know, you start checking, you're just getting older. You can't do what you used to do. You can't go like you used to go. You can't work as hard as you used to work. And, and so I didn't think that much about it. I would just sit down, I would rest, I would take a break, and then I'd get back after it, whatever it was going on. Well, it got to the point where I realized, you know what, I, I need to do something about this. I need to find out what's going on. So I called my doctor, made a doctor's appointment, went in to see my primary care doctor. And you know how that goes. Doctors, they kind of listen to your story. They kind of uh, help you figure out what's going on. I'm so grateful that God put the doctors in my life, that he put in my life at that particular time. Because that doctor visit led to some lab work. Lab works led to some, some tests. And uh, in November of that year, I had what was called a CT calcium scan. If you're working in the healthcare industry, you probably know what that's about. I had a CT, CT calcium scan that, that revealed I had unusually high levels of calcium that had built up in my body. And so that was necessary for me to go and take a next step. And my next step was to go see a cardiologist. And uh, he wanted to do a stress test. So he put me on that treadmill and I lasted about six minutes. And I was done. And he said, Mr. Baker, I think we need to take this thing one step further and try to find out what's really going on. And, and I'm going to schedule you to have a heart catheter so that we can go in and find out what's going on and what's causing this fatigue, what's causing you to have the symptoms that you're having. But there's definitely something going on. We need to figure out what it is. So I had a heart catheter scheduled for December the 3rd in 2020. Anybody remember what was going on in December 2020? It was the height of the pandemic. Uh, hospitals were still trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, people are sick everywhere. People are dying. Friends and loved ones are anxious, scared. Everybody's hunkered down at home. There, there, there's, there, there is so much uncertainty in the world at that particular time. And, and my doctor schedules for me to go into a hospital on December the 3rd in 2020 and have a heart cath. Try to figure out what's going on. If you back up two days from December 3rd in 2020, on December the 1st, my mother's health had deteriorated to the point that we had to get some hospice help and some hospice care. And I'm so grateful for hospice. If you're here today and you're connected with hospice, thank you for what you do for people. But on December the 1st, my brother and I hopped in the car and we drove from Palm Coast, Florida to Charlotte where my mother was in, in hospice care spent the night because we got in late and on December the 2nd we spent all day at the hospice facility with my mother and I knew when we got there and looked at my mom that this was probably going to be the last time that I would ever see my mother on this side of eternity and late that afternoon I had to do one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life you see in 2004 when my father passed away he was at home Surrounded by uh, all, all of our family and our closest friends. And I was sitting by my father's bedside and I actually got to hold his hand when he breathed his last breath and Jesus took him to be with him in eternity for heaven, with heaven, with him. 
And church, when I tell you it was one of the most holy moments that I've ever experienced in my life, it truly was a holy, holy moment. And I've been privileged over the last 25 years as a pastor to sit by a lot of people's bedsides who were in that same situation, whether due to a sickness or an illness or an accident or, or whatever. And I've, I've had the privilege as a pastor to sit next to people and hold their hand and watch them slip out of this world into eternity. And it's a holy moment. But on December the 2nd in 2020, I was not able to do that with my mother. And I had to do one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I had to kiss my mom on the cheek. I had to tell her that I would see her again in eternity one day. And that if she saw my daddy before I got back to tell him that I love him and I miss him. And I said goodbye to my mother and I got in a car and I drove back to Florida because I had to be at the hospital the next day for my heart cath. My phone rang on December 3rd about 5.30 in the morning. And my younger sister, Christy, who's here today, uh, she was weeping on the other end. And she said, Brian, mom's gone. Mom breathed her last breath on December the 3rd, about 5.30 in the morning. And I couldn't be there. And I had to get up in about an hour to be at the hospital for my procedure. I never told my mom what was going on in my life because it would have, it would have made a bad situation even worse. But it was hard leaving her that day. Even though I know the hope that we have in the resurrection... And I know my mom is a Christ follower, and I know I'm a Christ follower, and one of these days I'm going to see her again, and we're going to spend eternity together. I, there's not a doubt in my mind about that, but still, in that moment, it was, a, it was a tough season. Six hours later, that same day, I would have a heart doctor come to my bedside and say, Mr. Baker, we found out what's causing your fatigue. He said, you have unusually high levels of calcium. They're probably genetic in your life because you're, you're healthy. Probably genetic, but you have unusually high levels of calcium that are blocking and clogging every major artery to your heart. And because you're as young as you are and because um, uh, of the medical uh, technology today, he said, I'm going to recommend that you have quadruple open heart bypass surgery. I hadn't even turned 50 years old yet. Just lost my mother that morning about six hours earlier. And then he begins to describe the procedure as if it's going to kind of set me at ease a little bit and help me feel any better, okay? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what in the world's going on. He said, let me just explain to you what, what's going to happen. He said, we're going we're to obviously put you under anesthesia. We're going to cut your chest open. We're going to cut your sternum and open your chest cavity. And we're going to put you on an ECMO machine. I never heard what an ECMO machine is in all my life. I said, what's an ECMO machine? He said, oh, that's the machine that's going to keep you alive while we do the surgery going to put you on an ECMO machine and it's going to keep you alive while I remove your heart for about 40 minutes. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to remove your heart for about 40 minutes. We're going to harvest some veins out of your leg. And here's what he said. He said, I'm going to replumb your heart like he's working on my kitchen sink. All right. That's, that's a, he said, I'm going to replumb your heart. And he drew me a little diagram on the, on the, on, on, on the whiteboard in, in my room. And listen, church, I know I'm not the only guy to ever have open heart surgery, okay? And, and I get that. But the uncertainty of that day changed my life. It changed my perspective on what's, what matters most in life. It changed my perspective on the nature and the character and the goodness of God. Listen to what he, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 about the uncertainty of life. This is poetry. This is imagery. Uh, so you have to kind of use your imagination a little bit and, and put it in a context for our world today. But he says in verse 1, send your grain across the seas and in time profits will flow back to you. Divide your investments among many places. In other words, diversify your portfolio. Okay, don't put all your eggs in one basket is what he says. Look at what he says next. He says, for you don't know what risks might lie ahead. In other words, life is uncertain. 
When clouds are heavy, the rain comes down. Whether a tree falls north or south, it stays where it falls. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, every cloud they never harvest the crop. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in your mother's womb, look here, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Remember what Proverbs 16 and verse 9 says, we can make our plans, but it is the Lord who determines our steps. So you don't know the activity of God who does all things. Plant your seeds in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. Here's the phrase again. For you don't know, here's the uncertainty, for you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another or maybe both. And the uncertainty of that day changed my perspective on life for all of eternity. And it changed my, my, the way that I view the nature and the character and the goodness of God. You say, Brian, what, what did you learn in that season of uncertainty? Here, here's the big idea that I learned. I learned that I have to see my uncertainty through God's love instead of seeing God's love through my uncertainty. Does that make sense? I, I have to learn to see the uncertainty of life that I'm experiencing going through the lens of God's love instead of seeing God's love through my uncertainty. How many of you ever felt like God doesn't love you or care about you because of your circumstance or situation? I have. Things are in the tank. You lost your job. You get the health diagnosis. You lose a loved one to an accident or an overdose or there's an addiction or something. And you feel like because of your circumstance or situation, God doesn't love you and God doesn't care about you. Can I tell you, the Bible's got a verse for those of us who think that that way as well. And I've been there. I've been there. I, I, just because I've, I've been a pastor and just because I've been a church leader doesn't exempt me from the uncertainties and the difficulties and the troubles of life. But the scripture is very clear. I want to read to you what the Apostle Paul says. And maybe somebody here today, you need to hear this because you're going through an uncertainty and you're questioning the whether or not God really cares, whether or not God really knows, whether or not God is even interested in what's going on in your story. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter... Uh, um, eight in verse number 38, the apostle Paul says, and I am convinced, everybody say convinced. I am convinced that's a, that's a conviction that he has. It's a no, so kind of attitude. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Listen, listen to what he says, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will, will be able to ever separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus. You see, when you begin to see your circumstances through the lens of God's love, instead of looking at God's love through the lens of your circumstances, it changes your perspective about the nature and the character of goodness of God. Because the nature and the character and the goodness of God is that he is all good all the time and he cares about every single thing that we face and go through. There's nothing that catches him off guard or by surprise and we can trust him with every single area of our life. See, I had to learn that. I basically I, I had two options in that moment when that doctor said, Brian, you, you need open heart surgery. You're going to have a massive heart event. I learned that I could either question the uncertainty. And can I tell you where that leads to? It leads to worry. It leads to anxiety. It leads to fear. It leads to doubt. I, I can question the uncertainty or I can embrace it. I wish that I could tell you that I was super spiritual that day, but I wasn't. Pastor Brian's not the title that I, that I wanted on my, on my name tag that day. I learned that I could either question it, and I've been there and done that, and, and I would dare say that many of you, because of your circumstance or situation, uh, there's been some anxiety and some worry and some fear and some frustration uh, and some questions, and, and you're questioning. By the way, can I tell you, you're never going to get the answer to the why question. It's not ours to know the answer to the why. 
or I could embrace the uncertainty that I was facing and that I was going through. Listen to what Solomon says again in chapter 11 and verse number 6. He says, plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. In other words, Brian, get up every day, do what you know to do, love your wife, lead your church, grow in your relationship with me, and face every single day as if it were your last day. And I learned to embrace the uncertainty of my life in that season of uncertainty that I was going through. And if I could sum up that season or the lesson that I've learned in one statement, it, I want to give it to you today. This is what I call our bottom line thought. Okay, and This is what I hope you'll remember maybe when you're having lunch today with your family and your friends. Or when you're sitting in your recliner watching football and you're sitting around the living room with everybody, maybe you'll talk about this. Uh, this is a, 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 what I call the bottom line thought for today. All right, When life is uncertain, God is still good and he's still in control. When life is uncertain, God is still good and he's still in control. So what's the application for today? It's real simple. It's easy, it's easy to, to communicate. It's easy to say, but it's really hard to do. But because of the nature and the character and the goodness of God, every single one of us have the capacity to choose to do this, okay? So as you leave today, I want to give you this little application point to help you uh, uh, know what to do next. And we simply have to learn to stop asking why and start trusting God. We've got to stop asking why, and we have to start trusting God. So, season of anticipation, really excited about what God wants to do in my life. Season of growth, really grateful for the experiences that God gave me to grow as an individual and as a father and as a leader and as a husband and as a pastor. When it came to that season of uncertainty, it felt like my world was going to fall apart. But at the end of the day, here's what I know. God is good, God is faithful, and I can trust him no matter what comes in my life. Um, so begin season four. I'm in season four of my life. You had told me two years ago that I'd be living in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Not in a vocational ministry. Working a secular job. Doing what I'm doing right now. I said, you're nuts. You're crazy. Because I got a plan. I had a plan. But in season four of my life, Karen and I decided that, you know what? God's been too good. God's been too faithful for us not to trust him with our future. And there are some things that matter most in life. And we decided that it was time for us to, to make a big change in our life. And we moved from Florida in July of this year uh, to Fort Mill to be close to our adult our, our adult children. We have two boys. Bradley got married this past April. Stephen's getting married next May. And we moved back to Fort Mill to be close to our family um, so that we could do the things that matter most. And we're intentional about simplifying our life. I'm going to be a grandpa for the first time in about two weeks, and I'm really excited about that. But God's brought us to a place to where, God, I don't understand why things have happened the way they've happened, why things went the way they went, why they're going the way they're going. But God, I trust you. And um, I make half of what I was making last year. I drive a 30-year-old truck as a daily driver. I live in a two-bedroom apartment, but I'm more content now than I've ever been in my life. And I wouldn't trade the journey for anything in the world. So this is a season of, of contentment. And I don't know what God has for my future. I know my calling. I know the gifts that he's put in me. And I take that with me every single day when I go to work. And I just want to be faithful to use them for his honor, for his glory. But maybe you're here today and you're facing a season of uncertainty. And I don't know what it might be. Maybe you're questioning your eternity. Maybe that's uncertain for you. Can I tell you? Here's three things I want you to know today. Number one, God loves you. Number two, I care about you. 
And number three, this church cares about your eternity because God loves you, Jesus died for you, and we care about you. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we close today. And Whatever the uncertainty is in your life, and I would dare say in a crowd this size, there's something. Again, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe there's a financial struggle that you didn't anticipate. Maybe you've worked hard uh, to, to build a business that um, because of inflation uh, and, and other things that are going on in our world, it's just, just not really profitable, real productive right now. Maybe there's a mental issue that you struggle with and you're discouraged and depressed more than you ever thought you would be. I, I don't know what it is for you, what, but I wonder if there's somebody here today, you'd say, Pastor Brian, I'm in a season of uncertainty right now. Would you pray for me? Would you be bold enough just to lift your hand so I can see who you are? I promise you I'm not gonna embarrass you or put you on the spot. Thank you. All over the room, there are hands going up. If you're watching online today, maybe you put a little something in the comments and say, hey, I'm going through uncertainty please pray for me. If that's you, just type that in the chat. I'd love to pray for you here in just a moment. The greatest thing that I can tell you, church, is stop trying to figure it out and start embracing the uncertainty and rely on the nature and the character of God who loves you, who created you, and who is for you. And you watch what He does in your life. And He'll take that uncertainty and help you begin to make some sense of it. You'll start to, to pick up whatever those pieces are and you'll watch him make a masterpiece out of the uncertainty and the chaos in your life. So I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna turn it back over to our worship team. And uh, I'm gonna hang around after the service. If you just wanna talk to somebody, uh, I'd love to pray with you or pray for you and help you in any way that I can. So God, we come to you today. Thank you for a new year. Thank you for a new season that you have given us. God, thanks for our story. And every person within the sound of my voice, whether they're on campus or online, Lord, I pray for those folks that raised their hands a moment ago. God, you know their story better than anybody. And uh, Lord, whatever the uncertainty is in their life, I pray that today they would understand and know that you know what they're facing and what they're going through, that you care and that you've got a plan and you're gonna accomplish your plans and your purposes in their life. And I pray, God, you'd grow their faith and their trust in you today in ways they never imagined or dreamed. Help them to face the uncertainty with a, with a courage and a confidence that can only be found in a right relationship with you. God, if there's somebody here today who's uncertain about their eternity, God, I pray today would be the day they would cross the line of faith and say yes to you. It's not a magical prayer. It's not a formula. It's just an attitude of our hearts that says, God, I want to know you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I need your help to live life and I want to spend eternity with you. And God, I pray if that's the prayer of somebody who's watching online today or in, in the room today, that today would be the day they would cross the line of faith and say yes to you. God, however you might use my story to help somebody today, I pray that some way, somehow, through the might and the power of your strength of your spirit, you would accomplish your good work in all of our lives. And I'm so grateful for the lift. So grateful for the opportunity to share my story. all these things we pray and ask in your name. Amen. Yes, I